Welcome back to Bad Things in History, where, once a week, I suffer through the horrors I find in the latest script, then make it your problem. Hey, I'm not going down alone. Each state has made its own special contribution to the horrible past. From a certain point of view, the United States is just a collective of shared suffering. Yet few parts of the country can match the utterly depressing and disturbing past of Georgia. In this episode, we are going to look at several events from the troubled history of this southern state. Let's begin with a Union spy that was captured and killed. Great Locomotive Chase James J. Andrews was born in what is today Weirton, West Virginia in 1829. As a young man, he moved to Kentucky. At first, he worked as a house painter. Later, James became a singing coach. When the Civil War started, he made a living smuggling goods across military lines. James was also a secret agent trying to help the Union cause. In early 1862, he created a daring plan to help the war effort. He made a proposal to his commander, Major General Don Carlos Buell. James wanted to take eight men, travel into Atlanta, and steal a train. Then he would drive it north, destroying Confederate infrastructure along the way. On the day the men were supposed to begin their mission, the train engineer didn't show up. They had to abandon the plan, but James was not going to give up so easily. In April 1862, he made the same proposal to Major General Ormsby Mitchell. The general gave his approval. This time, James had all the men he needed. With 22 volunteers, he traveled undetected into Georgia. They stole a locomotive known as the General near Kennesaw. As the group traveled north, they destroyed telegraph wires and railroad tracks. The goal was to disrupt Confederate communications and resupply efforts. William Allen Fuller was the conductor of the train that James and his men stole. He was determined to catch them. William pursued the group on foot, then by hand car, then via borrowed locomotives. After 87 miles, the general finally lost power near Ringgold, Georgia. James and his men disappeared into the countryside. William reclaimed his missing locomotive. James Andrews was captured before finding his way back to Union lines. He was given a brief trial in Chattanooga, Tennessee. James was sentenced to death by hanging for being a spy. On June 7th, he was taken to Atlanta. At 5 p.m. that afternoon, he was hanged. More specifically, he was strangled to death. Instead of being dropped from a great height, his feet were barely touching the ground. The rope did not break his neck. James slowly gasped for air until his body finally gave up. James had a wife in Kentucky. When she learned of his death, she never recovered. She passed away two years later, supposedly from a broken heart. Atlanta Race Riot After the Civil War ended, racial violence became a common and unfortunate feature of the southern states. There was perhaps no place more dangerous than Atlanta. In 1880, there were just 9,000 black residents in the city, but as it grew into a railroad hub, the population increased. African Americans moved to the area in large numbers. By 1910, there were 150,000 black residents in Atlanta. Many of the white citizens who inhabited the city were angry and felt threatened by this development. They didn't want African Americans competing for jobs that white people wanted. Jim Crow laws were passed in the 1880s. These regulations segregated black residents and confined them to more undesirable parts of the city. But they were still able to vote and work. Despite laws promoting discrimination, African Americans prospered in the booming economy. Unfortunately, disaster was right around the corner. On September 22, 1906, Atlanta newspapers reported that four white women had been sexually assaulted. Supposedly, black men were responsible for these offenses. By late in the afternoon, angry white men began forming gangs all over the city. Then they started walking through the streets, attacking any black residents they saw. By 10 p.m., there was a mob of about 15,000 people, which descended upon any African Americans they could find. By the next morning, about 30 black residents would be dead. Governor Joseph M. Terrell dealt with the violence by sending in militia. 
Most of them didn't arrive until about 6 a.m. on September 23rd. And when they did show up, it was mostly to protect white businesses. Black residents began fleeing the city, hoping to put distance between themselves and the angry mobs. One group armed themselves and gathered near Clark University to discuss what to do about the violence. They didn't have long to ponder their response. Militia arrived and disarmed the group of 250 black men. The mayor of Atlanta, James G. Woodward, was later asked by the New York Times what measures were taken to prevent a race riot. His response was, The best way to prevent a race riot depends entirely upon the cause. If your inquiry has anything to do with the present situation in Atlanta, then I would say the only remedy is to remove the cause. As long as the black brutes assault our white women, just so long will they be unceremoniously dealt with. Nobody is sure how many black residents died in the violence, but the attacks destroyed their economic prosperity and ultimately promoted even more segregation. Soon after the riot, African Americans were put under even more restrictions. In 1907, legislation was passed that created a literacy test for voting. Predictably, the test was administered in such a way to ensure that black voters never passed. It would be 1948 before race relations improved in the city. The Jim Crow laws that enforced segregation would remain in place until 1965. The race riot was ignored for decades. It didn't appear in local histories of Atlanta, and it wasn't taught to school children in the state of Georgia. Lena Baker Only one woman in Georgia has ever been executed in the electric chair. Lena Baker was born in Cuthbert, Georgia on June 8, 1900. Her family were sharecroppers. They farmed land which the family didn't own and had to give much of the profits to their landlord. Much of Lena's early life was spent working on farms. She devoted hours of her life every day to chopping cotton. By 1940, Lena had three children. She had to support her family, so she began working as a maid. In 1944, she began working for a white man named Ernest Knight. Ernest owned a grist mill which grinds grains into flour. He would sometimes take Lena there and imprison her in the building. Then he would sexually assault her for days. The townspeople knew what was happening and didn't like the relationship between Ernest and Lena. They tried to end it by threatening Lena. One night, as she was being confined to the grist mill, Lena told Ernest that she was leaving. Ernest picked up an iron bar and threatened to kill Lena with it. She began fighting with Ernest and managed to grab his gun. Then she shot and killed him. Lena Baker reported the event immediately, claiming that she killed Ernest in self-defense. Despite this, an all-white jury found her guilty of murder. Lena was sentenced to die in the electric chair. On March 5, 1945, she was executed. Before being killed, her last words were, What I'd done, I did in self-defense, or I would have been killed myself. Where I was, I could not overcome it. God has forgiven me. I have nothing against anyone. I picked cotton for Mr. Pritchett, and he has been good to me. I am ready to go. I am one in the number. I am ready to meet my God. I have a very strong conscience. Lena's descendants kept her memory alive. In 2005, she was granted a full pardon. The Lost Nuclear Bomb in addition to angry mobs and racial injustice, Georgia is also home to a discarded nuclear weapon. In the late 1950s, the Air Force was flying planes all over the world. Many of them carried nuclear weapons. In order to keep this fleet well-trained and operating efficiently, it was necessary to fly several training missions. On the afternoon of February 4, 1958, a B-47 crew in Florida began preparing their airplane. As part of that effort, a Mark 15 hydrogen bomb was loaded into the aircraft. Since it was a training mission, the bomb was not allowed to carry the core that would trigger a nuclear explosion. Later that afternoon, over Radford, Virginia, the B-47 crew finished a simulated bomb drop. Their job was complete and the crew was ready to return home. 
Unfortunately, an F-86 fighter pilot didn't see the bomber as he was diving. His fighter plane crashed into the B-47 and tore off one of its engines. The F-86 was destroyed, but the pilot parachuted to safety. The crew of the B-47 realized they couldn't land safely with the heavy hydrogen bomb on board, so the decision was made to jettison the weapon. Near Wausau Sound, the bomb was dropped. The crew didn't see it explode or make a splash. Due to damage to the aircraft, they also weren't quite sure where it was released. The Air Force began searching for the discarded weapon. By April 16th, they gave up, claiming that it was irretrievably lost. In the year 2000, another effort was made to find the weapon. It failed too. There is concern that one day, under the right conditions, the device could possibly explode. If it did, then the city of Savannah would be vaporized. Alberta Williams King Martin Luther King Jr. was a well-known leader of the civil rights movement. He was assassinated on April 4, 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee. However, he was from Atlanta, Georgia. King's mother, Alberta Williams King, was from Atlanta too, and she continued to live there long after her son's death. However, she would eventually meet a violent end too. Marcus Wayne Cheneau was born in Kentucky on June 30, 1951. In his early 20s, he became a believer of teachings from the Black Hebrew Israelites. This group believed that black people were direct descendants of the ancient people that inhabited Israel. It also claimed that black Christian church leaders were evil and deceptive. Marcus originally wanted to kill Jesse Jackson, however, he had to cancel that plan at the last minute. When he was ready to kill again, Marcus set his sights on a new target. Alberta King was an important figure in the black community and he planned to end her life. On June 30, 1974, Marcus was sitting in the front pew at the church. Alberta King was playing the organ as services began. Marcus stood up, produced two handguns, and began firing. Alberta died from a shot to the head. Marcus was arrested and put on trial. After being found guilty, he was sentenced to death. However, the King family did not believe in the death penalty. So, in early 1995, Marcus was resentenced to life in prison. Just a few months later, on August 3, 1995, Marcus died from complications of a stroke. Derwin Brown Sometimes elections in Georgia can be a violent affair. Derwin Brown was born on June 22, 1954 in Fort Knox, Kentucky. By 1977, he was living in DeKalb County, Georgia. He became one of the county's first black patrol officers. Derwin also helped troubled teens and wrote a column for the local newspaper. In November 2000, Derwin decided to run for sheriff. He promised to clean up corruption in the department and do more to fight crime. Derwin's opponent in the election was Sidney Dorsey. Sidney was the first African American to serve as sheriff of DeKalb County. Derwin won the election, however, Sidney wasn't willing to accept defeat, so he convinced a sheriff's deputy named Melvin Brown that the best way to help his career was to kill Derwin. Melvin approached Derwin's home on the evening of December 15, 2000. He saw Derwin outside in front of the house and opened fire. Derwin Brown died after being shot 12 times. Sidney Dorsey wasn't very good at covering his tracks. It didn't take investigators long to realize he was responsible for the shooting. Sidney was put on trial along with Melvin. Both were sentenced to life in prison. Derwin's family sued the city and were awarded $776 million, but the case kept winding through the courts for years, and eventually the family was unable to collect anything. A bill was introduced into the Georgia House of Representatives, seeking to provide some financial relief for the family's suffering. However, it didn't get enough votes to pass. Georgia history is so horrible that we could have made an entire series on it, but all terrible things must come to an end, including this episode. What do you think about these troubling events, and which state would you like us to cover next? Let us know in the comments.
If you made it this far, then we would like to ask a small favor. Please like this video as well as any others that entertain you. It's a small effort on your part, but it really helps our channel grow. Thank you for watching Bad Things in History.